everyone knows about petrol and diesel and electricity as things that you put into your passenger vehicle to make it go, even though some people have difficulty telling them apart. However, the overwhelming majority of people have no inkling that there are more than those three types of fuel that can make a car go. Hardly surprising because it's not exactly a riveting subject, but please don't stop watching yet. I'll try to insert some awful jokes to make up for that. So let's get straight into it. Alternative fuels include used vegetable oil that can be used in diesel engines. There are ethanol-based fuels that can be used in modified petrol engines, such as E85, which is made up of 85% ethanol and generally 15% gasoline. There is also E100, which, as the name suggests, is 100% ethanol-based fuel. And very popular in Brazil, as they have lots of biomass left over from sugarcane production, which they can then process into fuel. And then there's the electric vehicle haters' favourite, hydrogen. The wonder fuel that promised to solve all the world's automotive problems. It was the fuel of the future for, what, 45 years? But turned out to be just a series of unfulfilled promises and dead ends. An automotive version of Brexit, if you will. I know some of you may argue, oh, but it's used in buses and shit. But I did say at the outset this was specifically for passenger vehicles, as things that you put into your passenger vehicle so it doesn't count. There are synthetic fuels, also called electrofuels or e-fuels, which is a mixture of carbon monoxide and hydrogen and can be used as a substitute for petrol. But at time of recording, no one has been able to come up with a cost-effective way of producing it. And of course, there are also cars that run on CNG or compressed natural gas, which is very popular in emerging markets. But I'm not going to talk any more about that because it's very similar to the subject of this video. So the subject of this video is this weird left field alternative fuel, which in fact isn't that left field because it's the most popular transport fuel after petrol, diesel and electricity. And it powers a whopping 2% of the world's cars. Liquefied petroleum gas, or LPG, is a byproduct of the same process that creates other fossil fuels like petrol and diesel. But for a long time, its producers would just burn it off the top of their facilities, which made oil refineries look like Mordor. However, some bright spark thought, hang on, instead of burning it, why don't we sell it as fuel? Now, at this point, I'd delve into the history of LPG, or autogas, as it's also sometimes called. But the Wikipedia entry has just a single paragraph talking about how gas was used in combustion engines as early as 1823, something, something, Hanover gas filling station in 1935, something, something, 1970s, it was, became more widespread in trucks and buses and stuff like that. And in all honesty, if there's more out there on the history of LPG, I didn't find it because I couldn't be asked. So at this point, you're probably asking, why would anyone even want to use this LPG slash autogas thing when we have a tried and trusted go-go juice that is petrol or diesel? Why? Because it's very cheap, that's why. It's the fuel for the miserly, tight wad, tight fisted, skin flint, money hungry cheapskate. And to prove it, this is the spreadsheet of the fuel that I estimate to have saved over the near as makes no difference 10 years I owned a Volvo S60 I converted to run on LPG. The amount that I estimate to have saved in petrol over the time that I owned the car is superior to what I paid for the car and what it cost to install the LPG kit. So I think I can safely say that it was a worthwhile investment. Now, thanks to the fact that the fluctuation of fuel prices is about as constant and predictable as my wife's mood, the amount you save by using LPG can vary wildly. However, money saving is not LPG's only advantage. It's a lot cleaner than petrol and diesel. It emits 15% less CO2 than petrol, less than 50% of the nitrous oxide that petrol emits, and less than 99.9% .9 of the particulate emissions of diesel. Now, it's all nice, low pollution and everything, but it still pollutes, don't forget. It's like choosing whether you'd prefer to be kicked in the nuts by someone wearing some Doc Martens with spikes on them, or someone wearing ballet shoes. It's still gonna hurt. 
But the way the world is working, lowering emissions is a step in the right direction, so you're probably better off getting kicked in the nuts by the ballet shoes. Now, most LPG cars are petrol cars that have been converted to run on LPG. In some cases, they actually come from the factory with an LPG kit, and many brands have done this over the years. I think a current one that's very popular is the Dacia brand that make an LPG car that you can buy with a factory installed kit. However, most LPG cars are petrol cars that have been converted to run an LPG, and I own three of these, by the way, a BX, a Volvo 460, and a Volvo S60. You can convert diesel cars to run on LPG exclusively, or you can make it run on a mixture of diesel and LPG, and from what I gather, the fuel savings are absolutely bull-bashingly amazing. But very little information exists on that, so I don't know if it's a worthwhile thing to do or not. So for the purpose of this video, I'm going to stick to my personal experience with petrol cars converted to run an LPG. Now, it has some disadvantages. For example, my Volvo 460 and my Citroen BX had this massive fuel tank that took up more than half of the boot. That wasn't too good. But my Volvo S60 had one in the place of the spare tyre, which is all very nice. It meant that I couldn't really carry around a spare tyre, at least not practically. But it did have this huge advantage of giving me this huge range. If I filled up both the petrol tank and the LPG tank, I could do at least a thousand miles without having to stop if I wanted to. And actually try this crossing Spain and France back in 2008 as soon as I bought the car. Very cool. However, one of the big disadvantages of LPG is that fueling stations are few and far between. So they're a bit like prostitutes. You have to know where they are, otherwise you're going to look like a bit of a tit trying to seek them out. It also varies from country to country. Here in Portugal, it's more or less widespread, and I think in Italy as well. But when I went to France and I wanted to refuel in Spain, it was a bit of a palaver because Spaniards, first off, they only had that for, I think, taxes for a long time. And then when you did find an LPG fueling station, they had to have a special adapter for Portuguese cars because the standard for LPG adapters is not universal. Again, it varies from country to country and region to region. Another disadvantage that LPG had was that I couldn't park in certain underground car parks. Not because LPG was dangerous, it's just because people were senselessly afraid of it. They were afraid it was going to explode, but it wouldn't. LPG tanks have been subject to all sorts of tests and they won't explode. They might shoot out the spear of flame if they're punctured. That's it. <laughs> The main problem was if it ever leaked and the underground garage didn't properly ventilate that gas outside, if that makes sense, then that would be an issue. And the thing is, because most garages here in Portugal don't comply with law, they're not properly ventilated, then uh, what's cheaper to basically enforce the law on garages and make them redo their entire structure or make LPG drivers not park there? Yeah, you can guess what they went for. Didn't stop me parking in underground garages though, because I was supposed to have a sticker saying LPG on the back, but I found that to be a bit unfair. Why do I have to have a sticker on the back that's nice and big that shows what I burn in my engine, whereas, for example, my current C5 has no badging whatsoever saying if it's a diesel or a petrol or whatever. So that's unfair. So I didn't go around with a sticker and I parked anywhere I bloody well liked. So I skirted the disadvantage of not being able to park in garages by, well, just not complying with that. And in terms of the rarity of fueling stations, I was fine with that as well, because I had another tank of fuel in the car, of petrol. And if I ever ran out of LPG, I could just run the car on petrol. I'd never be stuck. It was brilliant. I really like that. However, today I drive a diesel and you ask, well, why do you drive a diesel? Well, basically because after 2008, and the financial crisis and the fact that petrol became so expensive people really stopped buying petrol cars at least the larger ones you can still find like small 1.2 liter petrols 1.3 maybe at the most but people just stopped buying petrols when it came to choosing a state or a saloon or something like that to the point where many brands sometimes just hardly even bothered having petrol cars in stock or available for sale in the country so when it came time to actually buy a big family car, I had no choice but to buy diesel, which is a shame because I'd much rather have LPG. Now, another disadvantage of LPG depends on the country where you live. And I live in Portugal. And the disadvantage of Portugal is that it is run exclusively by morons. Doesn't matter what part is in power, we always manage to elect idiots. And where am I going with this? Well, it's all about road tax. 
Now back in 2007, in July 2007 it has to be said, our road tax system here was reformed. Before this, there were no provisions for any kind of fuel except petrol and diesel. And after that, there were provisions for, for example, LPG, which was great. But then it turned out it was not to our favor, us LPG drivers. Why? Because when we went to actually pay for our road tax, and by the way, the road tax for LPG was about a fifth, at least in my case, a fifth of what I'd pay if it was petrol. And they said, no, you can't pay that. You have to pay the full petrol amount. And we were like, why? Well, because your car still runs on petrol. It would have to run exclusively on LPG. We said, but, but that doesn't exist. There's no such thing as an LPG only car. They all are petrol cars that are in converted. And they say, well, can't help you there. So even with sock puppets and trying to explain to them, you know, what LPG was all about. So yeah, it's lots of fun to be an LPG driver here because in one regard, the law sees you as a petrol car driver when it comes to pay taxes. But if you wanna park in a closed, ill-ventilated car park, then it's suddenly an LPG car. And then there's a last one that's a bit of a mixed bag because it's to do with the fluctuations of fuel prices that I think I actually mentioned at the outset. Thing is about LPG is that the price isn't as volatile as petrol and diesel. At least here in Portugal, it might be the same where you live, every week the price of petrol and diesel goes either up or down. The price of LPG, at least here, is far more stable. It will stay unaltered for a couple of months and then go up but it goes up in spikes, sometimes as much as five cents per litre, which would be a lot even for petrol or diesel. But given the low price of MPG, at least in proportion, it's a huge jump in price. Now, when I began to go around with LPG, it was about 50 odd cents a litre. Now it's nearly 90. Not brilliant, but it's still just over half of what diesel costs. So it's still very worthwhile. So there you have it. LPG, in my humble opinion, the least crap of the fossil fuels, with only two real main disadvantages. The first one being, in most LPG cars, you have to sacrifice the spare tire for the fuel tank. But then again, most modern cars don't even have a spare tire, so something you can probably get used to or work your way around. And the second disadvantage is that there are few filling stations. But it doesn't really matter because you've always got an extra tank of fuel. But don't forget that to compensate for these two disadvantages in return, you get the power performance and refinement of a petrol with the running costs of a diesel. And it's just because of that, the LPG has never lost its allure, at least for me. In fact, instead of buying this car, I very nearly bought a petrol Citroen C5 Tourer which was imported from another country because you can't really get petrol C5 Tourers in this country. And the only reason I didn't get it was because of the accursed 1.6 THP Prince engine that it had. I mean, it would have probably broken down shortly after buying it. So, alas, I didn't get it. And what about the future of LPG? Well, as long as there are petrol and diesel cars, there will be LPG because LPG is a byproduct of petrol and diesel. I think, in essence, as long as petrol cars can be converted to run an LPG, then we will have liquefied petroleum gas vehicles. So let's get straight into it. Alternative fluids, the left fluids, fluids, just burnt it off the top of their refineries. This is going to be, I'm going to, in the editing suite, I'm going to kill myself. Motherfucker which is a mixture of carbon. Hang on a sec, I've forgotten what it is. I have to look off camera. There are ethanol-based views that can be in this f***ing hell. So hopefully you enjoyed that video. If so, please give us a like, please subscribe, please share, please leave a comment, and also please check out the t-shirt store, which is this clickable icon on the bottom left of the video. And on screen now, a couple more videos for your enjoyment, pleasure, and entertainment. Thanks very much. Hope to see you in a future video. I bid you all farewell.